For your next SAT, this video is everything you need to know about functions. So for the SAT, the five function topics you need to know are going to be functions, line, linear model interpretation, linear versus exponential models, quadratics, and systems of equations. And if it's your first time here, my name's John. I've been an SAT math tutor for the past 10 years, and my specialty is taking a student who's currently in four, five, 600 range to 700 plus by their next SAT. Now let's take a look at functions. So first things first, we're gonna go over functions and this chapter, the next three minutes of this video is literally going to be the most important part because it's gonna set the foundation, the groundwork for everything else about to come. So first you have to understand how functions work for the SAT. So function looks something like this. And what you need to understand is how to understand these function notations. You're gonna see something like f of two. And what does that really mean, right? Well, you see how f of x, this is just a fancy way of saying y. We usually see f of x is equal to this or y is equal to that. So f of x is same thing as y. Now, if you see something like f of two, what does that mean, right? Well, usually in the place of the two over here, we usually see a x, right? So this, whatever's in the parentheses, is what goes inside the function as the x value. And whatever you get at the end, that's going to be known as your y value, okay? So that's the x value over here. The result is going to be the y value. So for example, when you plug this in, if you're looking for f of two for this function right here, what's gonna happen is you're gonna plug in two over here, you're gonna get four plus two, which is going to be six. So when your x is equal to two, your y value is equal to six, f of two is equal to six. So if the question is asking you to find out what f of two is equal to, it's asking you to find out what y is equal to when your x is equal to two. Another variation of this question is something like this f of b is equal to eight thirds, right? So that's our x value, that's our y value. You need to find out what the x value is when your y is equal to eight thirds. Make sense? Simple. Now, let's keep going. Number two, composite functions. So composite functions are just a fancy way of saying function inside a function. So for example, you see f of g of x over here, right? We're pretty familiar with this. We already saw this in the previous chapter. We just saw this like 30 seconds ago. We usually see f of x, right? And x is usually what gets plugged into the function, right? But in the place of x, in, per, in between the parentheses, instead of x, we now have g of x. We have another function. And what does g of x equal to? It's equal to this. So f of g of x essentially means plug in g of x for this x on f of x. Does that make sense? So f of g of x is gonna look something like minus five parentheses, and we're gonna plug that part in. It's gonna be two x plus three plus one. That's gonna be f of g of x. You plug in the functions for composite functions. And that's all you have to know. G of f of x works the same way. You just plug in the function, whatever's in between the parentheses. Next, you have to understand what x intercepts and roots and zeros are. So whenever you're given a function like this, when it's asking you to find out what the x-intercept is, just think about the graph. See, 5x plus 4, that's going to be a line. It's going to look roughly something like this. And the x-intercept is referring to the point where the graph, where the graph intersects the x-axis, which is going to be right here. That's going to be known as our x-intercept. So when you're given a graph like this, it's really simple. We just look at the graph, find out where the x-intercept is. However, when you're given an equation and you have to identify where the x-intercept is, how you do it is by plugging in y as zero and just solving for x. And now, why is that? Because for every single graph, whether it be a parabola, line, another line, weird looking line, no matter what the graph looks like, the x-intercept, which is going to be here and here and here, no matter what the graph looks like, the x-intercept is always going to be having y is equal to zero. Because in order for the graph to intercept the x-axis, which is going to be this line right here, in order for it to hit that line, your y will always need to equal to zero. So that means whenever you're looking for the x-intercept, your y needs to be zero. We know that it's always going to be zero. So as a result, for us to find x-intercept, we just plug in y for zero and we just solve for x. And that will be our x-intercept. Make sense? Pretty simple. Next, let's talk about the opposite dy-intercept. So instead of x-intercept, when we're working with a y-intercept like so, the y-intercept is going to be where the graph intercepts the y-axis. Very good, you're catching on to this. And when we're given a graph, we're gonna simply look at the graph and see where the graph 
intersects the, not the x-axis, but the y-axis for the y-intercept. So over here is going to be your y-intercept. But what if you're given an equation, right? How are you going to find it? Well, it's pretty similar to how you find x-intercept, but just the opposite. So no matter what the graph looks like, whether it be a line, parabola, or a weird looking line, we know that the y-intercept is always going to be located where? Located where the y-axis is. And the y-axis is located where x is equal to zero. See this line right here? That's where zero is. That's plus one, that's minus one. But in order for the graph to hit the y-axis, your x needs to equal to zero. Which means if you're looking for the y-intercept, you can find it by setting your x as zero because your x will always be zero. Got it? Makes sense. Let's go to the next one. Now, there are three types of functions you need to know for the SAT. First one's going to be the line, second is quadratics, and third is going to be cubic. You don't have to know any of these sine, cosine, trig functions. These three are going to be the only ones you need to know. Occasionally, there's going to be a fractional function, but that can be solved using the first thing we learned on how to interpret functions. Now, when it comes to three of these functions, there are two things you need to know. First one is going to be the shape of the graph, and second is the direction of the graph. Okay, so first, let's look at lines. How can you identify whether it's a line or any other type of graph? You have to look at the what? Highest exponent of the equation. So if you look at y is equal to x, the highest exponent is 1. And when the highest exponent is 1, you're working with a linear function. If it's to the second power, you're working with quadratic, third, cubic, kind of makes sense. So by looking at the leading or the highest exponent of the equation, you can find out the shape of the equation. And how do you identify the direction of the graph? You look at the plus or minus sign of the highest exponents coefficient. That sounds complicated, but here's what you do. You look at the equation and you go to the highest exponent, which is going to be right here. If it is positive, it's going to look something like this. If it is negative, it's going to look something like that. So shape is determined by the highest exponent and the direction is determined by whether it's a positive or minus on the highest exponents coefficients. Does that make sense? So you can identify the shape of the graph by looking at the highest exponent and you can find its direction by looking at the plus or minus sign of the variable with the highest exponent. Let's keep going. The second type is going to be the quadratic function. As we talked about, you can determine the shape by looking at the highest exponent. And for the shape, if it is positive, it's going to face upward. It's going to be a smiley face. But if it's negative, it's going to be smiling down. It's going to be a frowny face. And if you're wondering what these two things are, these things are known as vertical translations. It either moves the graph up or down depending on plus or minus respectively. So if it's going to be minus, it's going to shift the graph down. So this, so for example, we see minus two over here. This green graph is now going to look something like that. This graph is just minus x squared. This graph over here is going to be minus x squared minus two. There's also left and right translation, but we'll get to that in a second. Let's keep going. Last one is going to be the cubic graph. So cubic is going to have three as the leading exponent. And when it's positive, it's going to look something like this. And when it's negative, it's going to look something like this. And because we have a plus one over here, this graph is just going to go up one right here. And now it's going to roughly look something like this. That's known as the vertical shift. For the horizontal shift, it's going to occur inside of the exponent. What I mean by that is it's going to look something like x minus 1, 3 plus 1. This minus 1 is going to be a horizontal shift. In this case, it's moving to the right. And the plus 1 is going to be vertical shift moving up and down. If it's plus, it's moving up. If it's minus, it's moving down. And for the horizontal, it's kind of counterintuitive. It's kind of opposite of what you think. If it's negative, it's moving to the right. If it's positive, it's moving to the left. So for example, if it's x cubed, it's going to look something like this. Okay, but if it's x minus one cubed now, because it is minus, we know that it's moving to the right, right? So we're going to move one unit to the right. It's going to look something like so. Does that make sense? So just remember that vertical shift happens outside, horizontal shift moves on the inside. And if it's a quadratic function, just change this into a two. If it's a linear function, just change this into a one. It just works the same way. Okay. And that's literally everything you need to know about functions for the SAT. Let's move on to the lines, which kind of builds on top of the functions. So the very first thing you're going to need to know about lines is going to be known as the slope-intercept form. You're probably familiar with this. M is known as your slope. 
and B is known as your y-intercept. Now, what do we need to know about this? That's a simple structure. Well, the main skill you're gonna to need to have is going to be identifying the slope and the y-intercept from two points that are provided from the question. So for example, you're going to be provided these two points and the SAT is gonna ask you something along the lines of find the slope, find the y-intercept, or come up with the equation that contains these two points. So how do you do it? Well, first, you need to understand how do you find slope. Slope can be found by using the formula y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And as you can possibly guess, this is x1, this is y1, x2, y2. The order really doesn't matter as long as you're staying consistent. So to find our slope, we're going to use the formula 8 minus 6 and then 2 minus 1, which gives us 2 over 1, which means our m or our slope is going to be equal to 2. So if we plug it in, we're going to get y is equal to 2x plus b. How do you find the b value, which is known as the y-intercept? Well, you can do so by plugging in x and y. Let me explain. So if you look at this equation right here, we see that, okay, there's the b value right there. So as long as we know what the x value is and know what the y value is, our b is going to be the only unknown variable and we can solve for it. So where do we get these x and y's? You get one and six and you got two and eight. You can use either of those points. So if you plug it in, you're gonna get six is equal to two times one plus b, which means six is equal to two plus b. Our b is equal to four. So instead of having a b here, we're gonna plug in a four right there. Our equation is going to be two x plus four and that represents this these two points right there. Know how to find slope, know how to find the y-intercept so that you can generate an equation that contains those points. Next, you wanna understand the relationship between two lines that are perpendicular to one another. And the only thing you need to know here is that their slope is going to be negative reciprocal and your y-intercept really doesn't matter because if you think about two lines that are perpendicular, right? Whether it be perpendicular here or perpendicular here, perpendicular here, your y-intercept really doesn't matter where it is. As long as it forms this 90 degree angle, it's going to be perpendicular. That's why your y-intercept does not matter. But what does matter is going to be your slope. You have to make sure your slope is what? Negative reciprocal to one another. So if we look at this complicated looking line right here, we see that our slope is going to be what? Our slope is going to be negative two thirds, right? So negative reciprocal just means apply a negative. So we're gonna apply a negative, which makes it positive. And reciprocal just means to flip it. So if we, if we flip this, we're gonna get three over two, right? So our new slope for a perpendicular line is going to be three over two. And the equation of a line that is going to be perpendicular to this line is going to be known as y is equal to three over two x plus whatever the y-intercept is because y-intercept really doesn't matter. It could be 6 billion and it will still be perpendicular. So whenever it comes to perpendicular lines, make sure you know that the slopes have to be negative reciprocal and that's the only requirement. Next, think about the idea of point on the line. This is a pretty popular question on the SAT. They're gonna give you a line that looks something like this and ask, there's a point one six. Is this point on the line or not? There are 10,000 ways for you to check whether this point is on the line or not, but the key is to be fast. And how can you quickly find it? Simply just plug this point in, okay? Plug it in, and if the equation is true, that means your point is on the line. But let's say your equation really doesn't match up, right? That means your point is not on the line. So for example, let's try it on this one. 2x plus 3, let's see if 1, 6 is in there. That's our x, that's our y. We have 6 is equal to 2 times 1 plus 3, which is going to be 6 is equal to 5. Is six equal to five? No, six is not equal to five. And because it's not equal to five, it's not equal to five, the point is not on the line. So long story short, you can plug in the point and depending on whether it makes sense or not makes sense, you can identify whether the point is on the line or not. Let's go to the next type. You wanna understand how to find the intersection between two lines. So for example, if we look at these two equations, what shapes are they? Kind of touching back to what we have learned. What shapes are they? Well, they're both to the highest first power. And first power means they're both going to be what? They're going to be both lines. And how do you find the intersection point between the two lines? It's simple. All you have to do is just set them equal to each other. Here's why. 6x plus 2, right? So graph is roughly going to look something like that. And then minus x minus 5 probably looks something like that roughly. 
there's your point of intersection, right? And at the intersection point, what happens is there is a X coordinate and there's a Y coordinate. And at this specific intersection point, what happens is that both of these lines share the same Y value, right? Because they are intersecting at the same point, they're going to be sharing the same Y value at that point only. And because they share the same value, it's like five is equal to that and five is equal to that for hypothetical purposes. Because these two equations are equal to the same value of Y, that means we can set these two things equal to each other, right? 6X plus two is equal to minus X minus five. Now that we only have one unknown variable, we can solve for X and find out what the X coordinate of the intersection is going to be. Make sense? So if we solve this out, we're going to get 7x is equal to negative 7, x is equal to minus 1. That's where the x coordinate is located. How do we find the y coordinate then? Think about it. Well, you just simply plug it in to any of these equations. So if you plug it in minus 1, you're going to get 1 minus 5, which is minus 4. So y coordinate is going to be minus 4. That's the point of intersection. So if SAT asks you to find the x coordinate or the y coordinate of the intersection, simply set them equal because at the intersection point, they share the same x and y. Got it? Let's keep going. Now, you also have to understand how horizontal and vertical lines work because not every line is going to have some kind of slope. Some lines are going to look like this and some lines are going to look like that. And there are a couple things you need to know about that. So the first thing is going to be the vertical graph. Vertical graph looks like this. It looks like up and down graph. And for the vertical graph, you have to know that the slope is going to be considered undefined. Why is that? Because for a line that is vertical, all it's doing is just moving up, right? And we know the slope is going to be right. It's going to be rise over run. And because our slope is going to be going up by a lot by like 10, and we're not going to the right anywhere. We're not running towards anywhere. So your run is going to be zero. And whenever you're dividing by zero, what happens? It's considered undefined. So a vertical graph is going to look something like x equals to three or x equal to whatever number. That's the case. Those lines are always going to be considered undefined. What about horizontal graphs, right? Horizontal graphs, on the other hand, is going to have a slope of zero. Why is that? Well, let's look at y is equal to two, for example. Y is always going to be two. So what's going to happen slope wise is that our slope is going to be rising by none. It's not going up anywhere. It's going up by zero, but it's going to the right by a lot. So for like 10 or 100, by example, and because your rise is always going to be zero, your slope is always going to be zero, regardless of how far you run. Make sense? So horizontal graph, your slope is always going to be zero, and it's going to have a structure of y equal to a number or y equal to another number. Okay, vertical is X, horizontal is Y. So let's keep going. We're going to move on to the linear model interpretation. Now, instead of working just with numbers, SAT is going to incorporate some words, bunch of disgusting, nasty looking words and ask you, okay, we're going to give you a quick scenario that looks something like this. And I want you to convert words into numbers, which sounds terrible. And here's what you need to know about these types of questions. Okay, so whenever you get an equation like this, always put it in the form of slope intercept form, which is y equals mx plus b. And once you do that, your y value is going to be your final value. Your b value is going to be your initial value and your slope is going to be your rate of change. Okay. Here's how we apply to this type of question right here. The question shows the value of the home V in dollars from this to that can be estimated by using this equation right here, which kind of looks like a line. The question says T is the number of years since 2006. Okay. So question asks, what's 240,000 representing and what is the meaning of 5,000? This is exactly what you're going to see on the SAT. So what's the first thing we're going to do? We're going to put it into the slope intercept form, which is going to be Y equals MX plus B. In this case, it's going to be V is equal to what? Minus 5,000 T plus 240,000. And in terms of this question, what do these things mean? V represents the final value, okay? 240,000 represents the initial value of the house in 2006. And minus 5,000 shows the rate of change in 
value of the house. And because it's minus, we know that it's going down. In other words, the value of the house is decreasing every single year. So coming back to the question, 240,000, what does it represent? Initial value of the house in 2006 and 5,000, it represents the decrease in value of the house per year because we're multiplying by T, which represents the number of years. You can also apply this idea to the exponential model, but we get to that in a second. Okay. So let's move on to linear versus exponential model. And in these types of questions, you're going to be required to identify whether that scenario is linear growth or decay or exponential growth or decay. So these are going to be the main characteristics. It's going to take me like 30 minutes to go over every single one of them. So kind of look at that. It's pretty simple to understand, but let's apply to this question. In town X, the population is growing by 100 every single month with a population of 400. So if we put this into an equation, our population is going to be starting with 400 and it's going to be increasing by 100 every single month. And because M is to the first power, we know that this is going to be a linear growth. If you look at the equation, we know that it looks like a linear model. That's how you know it's going to be a linear growth, right? But what about in terms of rate of change? Well, the thing is, we know that we're adding 100 every single month month, right? The rate of change is constant. We're adding by the same amount every single month. And because the change is constant, we know that it's going to be a linear model, right? What about in terms of operation? We are adding, right? We're adding by 100 every single month. We're not multiplying or dividing. We're not doubling and multiplying it by two. We're adding by a certain amount. As a result, our operation is going to be plus or minus, which means this is going to be a linear model. Make sense? Let's keep going, guys. We're about halfway there. Okay, so quadratics is going to be a very popular chapter, popular topic on the SAT, and these are things that you have to know, okay? So the first thing is you want to understand how to find the x-intercepts or roots, okay? Remember x-intercepts we just talked about like five minutes ago? You know how to find it when it comes to lines, right? For example, like lines, you just plug in y is zero, pop it in, boom, you got your x-intercept. But for quadratics, a little bit different because unlike lines, there's a possibility of you having two x-intercepts or one x-intercept or no x-intercept at all. That's why whenever you're looking for x-intercepts in a quadratic functions, there are two ways to find it. First one is going to be factoring if the equation is simple or you're gonna use the quadratic formula if the equation looks complicated, okay? So here's a quick example. Is this a simple equation? Well, let's try to factor it. If it's factorable, it's a simple equation. If it's not factorable, it's not a simple equation. So can we factor this? Yeah, this is gonna look something like x, x plus 10 and x minus one. If you expand this out, you're probably gonna end up with this. So now that we have factored it, how do we find the x-intercept? Just find out value of x, that would make this into zero. So it would be minus 10 here or positive one here. These are going to be known as your x-intercepts. And that's where your x-intercepts are going to be located. Obviously not the equation and not the right graph, but that's the relationship. Now, if your equation is not so pretty and cannot be factored simply like this, you're gonna use something known as the quadratic formula. You probably heard of this weird looking equation, minus b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac over 2a. An easy way to remember this is this is later going to be your discriminant and this is going to be later your vertex for the x coordinate. We'll get more into that in a second, but let's keep going. So another important thing is you need to understand how to find the sum and product of the roots, right? So we just talked about how to find the exact coordinates of these roots, right? Sometimes you're not going to need to know where the exact roots are located. Instead, they're going to ask you to find the product of the roots, okay? So for you to find the product of the roots, you can obviously just factor it out, multiply them, and then find the product of the roots. But a faster way of doing it is by just using a product of the roots formula, okay? So for you to find the product of the roots, you're gonna do C over A, and for the sum of the roots, you're gonna do minus B over A. So in this case, product of the roots, is gonna be C over A, C is right there, A is going to be this imaginary one right there, our product is going to be just eight over one is going to be eight. And the sum of the roots is just going to be minus negative four and A, which is gonna be one. So our sum of the roots is going to be four. People often get confused on whether it be C over A, minus C over A, or B over A versus positive B over A. Don't get confused on it. That's gonna screw you over and you're gonna get that question wrong. So make sure you have that down in your head, 110%. 
Let's move on to the vertex. Vertex is probably the most important thing about quadratics chapter. And the vertex is representing the maximum or minimum of the parabola, which looks something like that. And SAT is mainly going to test you on your ability to find out where the vertex is located. And there are two ways to find out where the vertex is located. First one is by just simply doing math. You can use the formula minus b over 2a to the equation and find out where the vertex is located. So for example, y is equal to x squared plus 2x plus 7. Just do minus b over 2a, minus 2 over 2 times 1, minus 1. That's where the x coordinate of your vertex is located. And then you can plug this x coordinate back into here and find out where the y coordinate of the vertex is located. Pretty simple, right? But another second important method that you need to understand is that, but the second method that most students don't know is going to be the midpoint method, right? Midpoint method works like this. See, the thing about the vertex is that it's always going to be located in the exact middle of the two roots. So if your roots are located at like minus one and positive three right here, you can find out the X coordinate of the vertex by finding the exact middle of the two roots. And you can find the midpoint by using the midpoint formula. You add them up and then you divide by two. Okay. Minus one plus three divided by two is going to be two over two, which is one. So there are two ways to find the vertex. First one is the algebra. Second one is the midpoint. And the midpoint one is going to come extra handy when the SAT doesn't give you this equation. Let's say SAT doesn't give you the equation and it just tells you, okay, your roots are located at minus one and positive three. If you don't have the equation, you don't know what your B and A are. But because you know where the roots are located, you can pop it into the midpoint formula, find it like so. And because you don't have the equation, you're not going to be able to identify where the Y coordinate is, but SAT is not that mean. They're not going to ask you to do the impossible. Okay, let's keep going. Next thing is going to be vertex form and the standard form. These are the two forms that you have to know for the SAT. So the standard form is referring to the factored form of the equation and the vertex form is referring to something that looks like this. It's going to be y is equal to a parentheses x minus h squared plus k. Now, this is going to be what your vertex form is. And the purpose of the vertex form is to show you where the vertex is located. So if the question is asking you to show the vertex as constant or coefficients, constant or coefficients, then put it into the vertex form. Let's keep going. So if you have understood everything so far, you should be able to find every single one of these for this equation right here. So try to pause the video, try it out yourself. And then when you're ready, play the video back and we're going to go over it. So let's just look at this equation right here. Let's try to find out where the roots are located. So first to find the roots, I'm just going to simply factor. So I'm going to factor out the minus over here to make my life easier because it's already hard. SAT is tough. So how do we factor this? It's going to be X plus five and X plus one. My roots are going to be at minus five minus one. So it's going to be minus five minus one. Okay. What about the sum and product of the roots, right? So the sum is just sum is going to be minus B over a, right? So minus B is going to be minus six. A is going to be just one. It's going to be negative six. Yeah. I mean, you can use the numbers from here or from here. It really doesn't matter. You're going to get the same result. Okay. So the sum is going to be minus six and the product is going to be just C over A. So our C value, let's use this number here, minus five over A minus one. So our product is going to be just five. And where is the vertex located? Well, vertex can be found using negative B over two A. So we're going to do negative B over two A, which is going to be just six over negative two, which is going to be just negative three. Okay. So that's the X coordinate of the vertex. What about the Y? You simply just plug it back in. So we're going to get minus minus three squared minus six minus three minus five. And that's going to be negative nine plus 18 minus five which is going to be just four. So our Y value is going to be four. Our vertex is going to be located at minus three, four. And if we put this into the vertex form, it's going to be Y is equal to negative one X minus or plus three plus four like so. And what about discriminant and interpretation of the result? I'm going to link a video down below because discriminant is going to take way too long for me to explain in depth. So watch the video. It should be able to make sense. But if we find it, if we're going to do B squared minus four AC, and it's going to be 36 minus four parentheses minus one, and then minus five, which is going to be 36 
minus 20, which is going to be 16, which means it's plus, which means there are going to be two roots. This is going to make more sense once you watch the discriminant video link down below. So guys, as long as you can do these five things for quadratics, you're going to be set. You're not going to have any issues when it comes to quadratic questions. Let's keep going. So the last thing you need to know about functions for the SAT is understanding systems of equations. So first you want to understand how to find the solution between two equations. The most important thing is that solution between two equations is simply referring to the intersection point. So whether the SAT is asking you to find out the intersection between these two lines or a solution between these two lines, they're essentially asking for the same thing. And how do we find solution between two lines or two graphs? You set them equal to each other. Go back to the lines chapter. It's going to make sense. So whether it be just two lines sharing a same point or it's a line and a parabola sharing a same point, the same logic applies. You simply set them equal to each other and find out where the intersection point is going to be. And the last thing you need to know about functions is understanding how to identify the number of intersections between two lines. Okay. We're not looking for the exact location of the intersection, but instead we're looking for what the number of intersection between two lines. And when it comes to two lines, you can either have just one intersection point like so, or have zero intersections because two lines are parallel, or you can have infinitely number of intersections because they're essentially identical lines. Every single point is a point of intersection. And obviously if you're given a graph, it's pretty easy to identify the number of intersections, but SAT is not going to make your life that easy. It's going to, it's going to make you struggle. And how it's going to do that is by giving you this weird looking equation. And what most people do is they move this equation around and try to find out what the graph looks like and then do all sorts of crazy things. It's going to take forever. And SAT is all about doing questions quite quickly. So how you can do that is we're going to use something known as the matching rule. If you're not sure what matching rule is, I'm going to link it down below as well. You can watch it, understand it and apply it to this question. It's all going to make sense, but here's how it works. We're going to line up the Y's, X's and the numbers, and then we're going to look at the coefficients. So for Y, it's going to be one over two for X is going to be three and minus six. And for the number portion is going to be eight over 16. If we simplify this out, we are going to get what one over two, negative one over two, and then positive one over two. And you see how Y and number have the same ratio when Y and number have the same ratio. That's a code name for one intersection. As a result, our answer is going to be choice B. And a quick way to think about this, if all three of them match, you have infinite number of solutions. If X and Y are the only things that are matching, you have zero solution, lines are parallel, and everything else is going to be one solution. Whether it be they're all different, or this and this is matching, or this and this is matching, they are all going to represent just one intersection. And more details on that in the matching rule video below. And that's pretty much everything. Good luck on your SAT. If you guys found this video helpful, consider subscribing and liking the channel, and I'll see you on the next one.